we're here with Senator Larissa Waters. Thank you for joining us. One of the first things that has really struck us when doing a little bit of background research was the absolute outcry after your um, speech around No Gender December. Um, would you be able to give us a bit of background about why you felt the need to call for No Gender December? Yes, it certainly did cause a bit of unexpected controversy. Uh, a campaign group that was based in Queensland came to me, um, Play Unlimited they're called, and there are a bunch of primarily mums who objected to the fact that every time they tried to buy their child a toy, uh, there were segregated aisles of effectively pink and purple on one side and dolls and, and stuff that was deemed appropriate for girl children and on the other aisle or in a separate aisle, uh, you know, trucks and fun stuff and you know, stuff that was marketed for boys. And they also objected not just to the physical uh, positioning of those toys and the subliminal message that sent to any shopper heading into the shop, but also to the marketing of those toys as gifts for girls and gifts for boys, particularly around Christmas time. And they decided that they wanted to launch a campaign about this and they cited some research which had been done in the US which correlated increased domestic violence in countries with more rigid gender roles. And they then cited some research with correlate, which correlated rigid gender roles with things like the message that you send through toys about gender stereotyping. And so I thought this was a worthy cause and likewise object to my daughter being told that she must only like pink and princesses when in fact she should be able to choose whatever toy she likes and you should be encouraged to um, experiment with the full gamut of uh, toys to help her lo learn and grow. And so I backed the campaign, uh, little knowing that the Daily Telegraph would find this um, a point of ridicule and run a front page uh, depicting me as a Barbie, uh, saying Green's War on Barbie, and with the uh, very disappointing reaction, not just from the mainstream press, but from the other political parties as well. Um, folk who are either silent, but then later privately said they thought it was a great thing that I'd spoken out, thanks for your public support, guys. But predominantly, um, the ridicule that I received from most of the um, old white male liberal politicians in Canberra. And I thought that was a real shame because it's not like we just make this stuff up. There's research that shows when you have those rigid gender stereotypes, you have increased domestic violence. And we know in Australia, we've got a serious problem with domestic violence. We've got one in three women uh, over the age of 15 that in their life will experience some form of domestic violence. And for sexual violence, it's one in five. So we've got a serious problem here. And it's yes, it's about funding the support services and yes, it's about education, but it's also about getting to what is what is driving that? What are the underlying cultural and behavioural beliefs and norms that is, that is driving that perception? And it's gender inequality. And part of that is this gender stereotyping and segregation. So to come, cut a long story short, we were really pleased to shine a bit of a light on the outdated marketing of toys as for boys and for girls rather than toys for kids to help them learn and grow and a whole lot of sexist vitriol that then poured out online and, and in person. But the issue was raised and hopefully people thought about it and some casualties in the meantime, both literally and figuratively, but I hope that the conversation's been progressed. So yeah, um, it definitely um, did start to progress that conversation and it was really interesting to note um, Tony Abbott's response. Um, you mentioned that such a response in which we should let boys be boys and girls be girls is quite dangerous and such gender stereotyping actually leads to increased forms of domestic violence. Um, can you explain a little bit more behind that research? Why, does, why do stereotypes or entrenched stereotypes lead to um, increased possibilities um, and correl higher correlations with domestic violence? Well, I was horrified when the Prime Minister came out with that remark, let's let boys be boys and girls be girls, because my response to that was, let's let kids be kids. Why are we teaching boys and girls at such a young age with this kind of marketing and um, consumer indoctrination 
that they should like some things and not others and making them feel abnormal if they like something that is not marketed for their gender. Um, you know, for a start, you're setting them up for all sorts of self-doubt if they don't subscribe to that silly stereotype. And secondly, you're then entrenching that outdated stereotype. Um, so in terms of the, the correlation, it's, it's been raised time and time again in the Senate inquiry that I set up into domestic violence, which I was thrilled to get support from the other parties to establish, uh, that looking at the global statistics on violence against women, where those gender stereotypes are more rigid, then that's where you have increased rates of violence against women. And so the inference is that if the gender stereotypes were less rigid, then um, the violence would also be lessened. And um, I think this is something that warrants further examination. And I certainly don't think that we should be entrenching gender stereotypes. Um, if there is any hint that that can lead to increased violence against women. And the notion that um, stereotypes and something being for girls and for boys is what's behind um, gender inequalities is really alarming because we know that inequality is driving domestic violence fundamentally. And if we don't tackle those societal messages that get sent about inequality, well, we'll never fix anything and we'll be fighting these battles like we've been fighting for centuries in centuries to come. Now, I don't want that for my daughter or her daughters. I want us to be able to finally achieve gender equality. And this is just one way that we can tackle the problem. It's not the panacea, but it's an important part of fixing this terrible perception that women are somehow worthless and should do um, different things and should not have the same aspirations as men. Um, we've shown that we're more than capable of achieving whatever we set our minds to. And I think that kids should be fostered with that sense of self-belief and awe and wonder and hope for themselves that's not um, shackled by these bizarre stereotypes and for the sense of marketing, I mean, of all the insults, just to sell more stuff, that it can have this unintended negative outcome, well, let's fix that. Yeah, and, and we wouldn't want to even hypothesise on the effect of um, such gender stereotypes on people who are born intersex or yeah. um, with a non-binary gender identity. Look, that's, exa that's exactly right. And I guess we didn't touch terribly much on that in the debate because um, the perhaps the mainstream press just weren't prepared to go that far. But, you know, we've got intersex and transgender people um, right across the world who don't fit into those gender roles, those traditional gender roles. And how are they meant to feel when you've got these stereotypes reinforced? I mean, as it is, you see terrible rates of suicide in the LGBTI community and self-harm, particularly in teenage years. If we can make these sorts of easy decisions about marketing that not only contributes to uh, less violence against women ultimately, but also helps transgender and intersex people um, accept themselves and feel like society accepts them too, which, they, which, which it does and should, then how is that a bad thing? I, I remain surprised to this day at the vitriol and the rejection of the notion that marketing um, somehow doesn't influence anything. Well, of course it does, and if marketing and advertising didn't work, well, they wouldn't do it.